Welcome to the first episode of County Conversation, the cricketer's brand new podcast covering all things UK domestic cricket. The show will be weekly, it will hopefully be excellent, and it will definitely feature me, Cameron Punsonby, as your host, as well as two, as well as two of the cricketer's expert journalists. Today, we have the two Nicks, Nick Howson, the digital editor. Hello. And Nick Friend, the QPR fan and long read fanatic. <laughs> Hello. Excellent. Title. <laughs> Finally, we'll also be joined by a regular guest from the circuit as we focus on themes around the game. This week, our theme is, well, the start of the season and the challenges that that presents. And our guest is former England head coach and current Nottinghamshire head coach, Peter Moores. Hello. Perfect. Very happy that we've got that under the belt. I've briefed everyone about how we're going to start the show and everyone succeeded 10 out of 10. Anyway, welcome one, welcome all. Firstly, Peter, thank you very much for joining. I know you're in the middle of a two-day friendly match at the moment against Northamptonshire. How are not shaping up? How did you winter? What are your hopes for the season? Yeah, uh, thanks. I mean, basically, we're in that exciting part when it's all going to unfold over the next few months. Uh, at the moment, we've had a decent pre-season, went to Abu Dhabi for 12 days, which credit to how that was organised. Every time you go on a pre-season sort of tour, you're always... Worried that will the cricket be good? Will will it be organised properly? Will you actually get some good competitive cricket? We got some great cricket there. Somerset were out there, Warwickshire and Yorkshire and ourselves organised really well. Um, and we got some really good cricket. So when we got back here, actually, it felt like the first thing of the winter is you're trying to get out the nets. The lads have been in the nets for ages. And nets are great. Uh, you do your skills, but it's completely different in some ways to the game. You've got to get used to that competitive edge. So we got that in Abu Dhabi. Um, we come back with a game against uh, Cardiff University, which was a sort of first run out in English conditions. And then we're playing against North Ants. And in some ways, it's quite nice. Actually, it's a bit more batter friendly at the moment. We're using a Kookaburra ball. So it's a little bit nicer for the batter. Sometimes in April, uh, it can feel quite hard work to get your bat on the ball. But actually, at the moment, it's a little bit more weight to the batters. And touch wood, we look like we've got a nice day today. So we should get a decent day's cricket there. Now, we're going to try our best in this podcast not to just look at everything through an English lens. But I know Nottinghamshire, you've described yourself as the skills factory and counties do largely exist to produce players that go on to international cricket. Something I think we'd be really interested in your view of is how has basketball, for want of, well, the only phrase, for want of a better phrase, how has that changed your role as a coach and how has that changed the way you guys prepare? Because... England have a very set way of playing. And if you want to improve players in a way that is going to make prepare them for international cricket, there's now a style that they need to kind of adhere to. So how, how has that changed your methods as, as a head coach, if at all? Well, I mean, your, your methods, or your, your style as a head coach, it sort of evolves all the time. I think anybody who does a job, I'm sure through journalism, you, you pick up different things, you change things that, that adapt. Now, basketball has been, it's been such an interesting debate. The whole thing about the style of play, what it has done, it, it's got an interest in Test Match cricket. It's got people wanting to watch it again. So um, I think the biggest thing that it changes is how players view themselves. The game is changing so fast, T20 cricket. So I think the big change is in the player. I think what the coaches can be is sometimes be that stable factor. Uh, there's some things in the game, the people you're watching play basketball or for England at the moment, they're highly skilled practitioners. At what they do they're really they're really skillful at the end they're at the end of their um they've got to there through a long journey of doing skill work um like what listening to a concert pianist now if you're not a concert pianist now you're not going to suddenly be able to come on without doing all the basics a lot of scales a lot of time doing different tunes as you build up to it so we're in that bit and you're trying to help lads understand that there's there's basics in the game that you have to obey to a certain degree to be able to then get them fast enough and do exceptional things that look that are really flair in front of people. And you've got to be able to do that. And then we explore what they can do with them. And that to me is where it's great fun. So I love the fact that players can go and test out all sorts of shots. They can test out all sorts of deliveries and eventually they've got to find a way of making that work. Because if they if they can't be successful actually in the games, they're not going to progress anyway. Ben Duckett's been one of those players who's kind of come through and kind of gone on to the next level from Nottinghamshire and been really successful for England. He's now going to come back into the, your dressing room environment. How helpful is that to have someone kind of like an agent on the inside, as it were, to say, this is how things are operating. You kind of have give you a nudge and a wink here. This is kind of 
the XYZs of how Brendan McCullen operates. Is that helpful for, for, for you as, as a coach? Is, or would that be a case of kind of almost kind of infringing on your own responsibilities? Is he going to be telling Hasib, come on, mate, I'm going to stick it over the top now if you want to, if me and you are going to open the batting together? It's, it's brilliant to have England players in your dressing room, if I'm honest. I mean, we've had Stuart Broad for a long time. Um, but it's fantastic because I think often what you get from an England player, whatever the regime they're working to, is the simple version of what it is. So there'll be a version out in the public. And I think if you speak to Ben or when I spoke to Stuart, I mean, really, um, what I think Ben Stokes and Ben McConnell are pushing is they want to play aggressive, positive cricket and they won't be able to get better. And they're not telling them how to do it. Um, there's a style of play now that's starting to merge across formats, which is coming through T20 cricket, um, a way of people playing. So I often say to batters, you need one game across three formats really now, it, unless it's going to get too complicated. You've got to be able to turn the volume of that game up and down. But then it means that some of the shots that are played in T20 are going to come out in test match. And the myths of some of the, you know, because a reverse tweet was seen as a risky shot. Well, for some people, it's not risky. They can repeat it really well. So there's no, everything's risk reward in, in probably in life, never mind just in cricket. Um, and that to me is all coming out now in test match cricket. So what Ben brings to us is a load of experience. Um, how he plays for England is how he played for us for the two years before he went into England. He struck at 75. So it's great because he'll be doing nothing different. We just get a, a, what I'd say one of, us, one of our lads in who's a quality player, who's already been through a journey, is now playing at the highest level. Well, if that's not inspiring for everybody, um, we're doing something wrong. Nick, do you want to go in from your previous question? I was only going to ask about, and to be honest, exactly that. The, 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 the impact, I mean, as, exactly as Peter said there, of, of having someone come in who, as you say, sort of is that agent on the inside, but also has, um, as you say, I mean, in a way, I don't know, it feels like, Duckett's probably been more empowered than most through this because he was doing this for North Ants back in what sort of pre-2016, wasn't he? And in a way, I don't know, sort of there must be a lot of players, someone like Jack Haynes, who's coming from Worcester, obviously can isn't that dissimilar a player in the way that he looks to be aggressive, looks to score. Does it does it just I don't know, has it sort of broken the do you feel like it's broken the shackles of, of a lot of county cricketers in a way? I know it's I know it's for a different game. I know uh you play 14 games of promotion relegation with different surfaces, different skill set bowlers, etc. Lots, lots, lots of very, I mean, lots of huge differences and variables. But I guess at source, there is for, for for the guys who are naturally more aggressive, who felt inclined to sort of drag their drag their game back in the past, perhaps maybe feel now that that sort of across the board they can afford to to sort of be a bit more than their natural selves, knowing that you know you don't have to do that much for that long to get recognised these days. Good snappy question. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you get. <laughs> um, yeah, I like that, Nick. To be fair, that was funny. Um, yeah, uh, I think I think there's no boundaries now, which is a great thing, if I'm honest, for all players. I think what players go through a bit of a journey, they they see it all, and and often you might watch a YouTube clip or a, an Instagram post, and you see the highlights package of somebody doing something, and you immediately walk out that you can do it. I think we probably do it when we watch Wimbledon or the Masters, and we go on the golf course and think we're suddenly going to play to scratch. Well, you can't. You have to go and do the work. So I think players balance it out, but the fact that they know where they want to get to, that they can go somewhere completely different, is great. I mean, often players get hurt but hurt by it. There's no doubt about that. We've seen players come off England programmes sometimes and they're trying to expand the game and they haven't quite got the skill set yet to do that. So then they have to do it. I often say to people, it's a bit like if you're a golfer and you've got a certain handicap, you might be able to go for the green, but not the pin. Now, if you go for the pin, you're going to get hurt a bit because you've got to play some percentages. Doesn't mean over time, the next two years, you get better and now you can start to go really adventurous. And I think that's where cricket, batting especially, has got to. Um, you you develop your skill. There's no limit to that development. There never has been. But now, certainly the boundaries with the way England have played. And I think we've seen England play like that. And we've seen it have success and also failure. You know, there's a repeatability to bat in that um, also is needed. And that balance is always one you're trying to strike. You've obviously got a, a domestic intake that have come from the same place, Peter. What, what are the sort of challenges associated with that? It's not quite... The in between is moving schools, but you know, still the guys know each other, and um, yeah, you know, have you sort of tried to manage or have you gone about managing that? 
I think like most things, they, they came in the winter. The way we work our winter is very much, I would say, it's an individual program in a sort of team environment. So every runs their own style to get better. The key is that really, um, I say to most players, we're not we're not paying you for the winter, we're paying you for the summer. It's your chance to get better. So they've been around that squad all winter, which is great. Uh, and now we come to the summer, you start to find your place um, within that squad. We've got a few changes because a couple of senior lads move on, some like Jake Ball moving to Somerset. Samit Patel, who was playing white ball for us, who'd been at the club forever, really, part of it, has also moved on. So it feels like a little bit of a change in the guard, um, which is good, freshen things up. But all three are really good lads. They've all settled in. I think probably uh, Josh Tong's had the toughest one because he's had an injury to go through, where for Dylan and for Jack, they've been able to do their prep. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think at the moment we've had... You know, someone like Freddie McCann come off the academy and we develop him. So it's the same for every player. You know, you get in with a group. It's amazing how quickly in sport you feel part of it um, when you're actually doing things. And the final the final nudge for the player is when he starts playing games, when he starts getting in and he starts performing um, and he gains that respect amongst the group. Peter, you mentioned kind of some players moving around. How, how difficult a decision was it to let Alex Hales, who's been a kind of been a not a not stalwart for however many years, kind of missed that chunk of the season with the T20 blast to go off and play on a major, no, sorry, not even major league cricket, the length of Premier League. Yeah, I don't think it's difficult because it's not our choice, really. If you, if, if you know what I mean, <laughs> players have the choice now. The players, the players decide and they've got so much choice. There's so many leagues around. Um, I think more like you always want your, to have your best players all the time, uh, but there's a reality to it. So everything is a negotiation. I think the fact we got Alex at the start for the first day and then we get him back, hopefully if we do qualify for the latter stages, means it's a really good equation for us. Alex is part of us, you know, um, plays all over the world, but he calls us home because we are home. And that makes it a bit mm. different, I think, for him. It's a tournament he loves playing in. Um, I think, you know, I think it was a couple of years ago, Alex was voted the, the number one Blast player by the, by fans. I mean, uh, so he's got a real affinity to the Blast. Um and to us so we love having him we'll miss him but in some ways it'll also create a chance for two or three of our maybe young players to get a chance to go which is great in <laughs> terms of that player choice that player power you say they're like teams don't have a choice but are we seeing does it basically provide both opportunities and kind of takes away opportunities for counties in that you've just replaced shaheen shafri with ben liston Faza hawk faruqi for the for the blast yeah. When you look for an overseas player, are you looking at maybe a smaller name who will be less in demand? So you'll be keeping them for the kind of for as long as possible over the course of the season, or is it that kind of star power where you know you might only be getting six players? Where where do your priorities lie as a head coach? It's again, it's a bit of a balance. Availability is a big one. I mean, you've got a World Cup going on this year, which is obviously taking all your top players out for a period of time. So I think. The way selection goes for me anyway is you've got you've got a various thing. you've got you've got your own eyes your gut feel you've got probably an analyst giving you the numbers and stats of how somebody's performing over the last sort of 18 months you know his sort of form guide and availability and building them into your team and then what we do know now because people play um in lots of different teams and groups you've also probably got players that you know who will know the player and you can get a bit of a steer on them as a person. So you put all that together and say, yeah, I think he's going to fit what we need at the moment. So the left arm option is something we haven't got for T20. Two left armers. Ben, a little bit untried in England, so he gets a great chance for us to have a look at him. And you know in summer like Faisal Haik Faruqi that you're getting a world-class performer who's played all over the world. So I think a really good fit. Both are very excited about coming, so it feels like a good fit. I think at the end of a season, you know a bit more about whether it worked or didn't work because it depends how far you go and how they go in the competition. Really. And to ask Nick Halson to turn to everyone's favourite topic in the world, uh, rules and regulations that are changed ahead of a county season. Uh, <laughs> Nick's appointed himself as the leading expert on it, or I've, I've appointed him as that. Uh, what are the changes we're looking at for the season? How are the, how are the matches going to be differ? And why are they important? Why have they been brought in? I, I was specifically brief that I was just here to snipe from the sidelines. Uh, I wasn't aware. That and you're, doing a, that. you're doing a fine job. Uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't aware that I'd actually, actually have to bring some uh, substantive uh, information to this, to this uh, equation. Uh, it's, it's way too early for that. I think, what's, I think what's really interesting is that 
we if we dip down into Kookaburra, we're going to get four rounds of that. I think that's going to um, probably be, I hate, hate to use the word fairer, but probably fairer. Um, a, a few more rounds. There was a bit of criticism that it sort of came and went and, and how much data did we really learn from doing two rounds in what was in July um, last last summer. Um, we're going to get two in, in April and May, I think, and then two more in, in August and September. I wouldn't imagine that the the second load of that will be too deep into the season to try and retain, I guess, again, a bit of a bit of a bit of fairness there. We saw an increase in in the number of overs bowled by spinners. I think it went up 10%. So I think therefore it's probably quite important that it is earlier in the season um, to try and to try and trigger that improvement. And I guess we will get on to the number of overs bowled by by the spinners. I guess the, the 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 draw is an interesting one, given that those points have been increased, and yet we've still got the um, the same bands as far as bonus points, batting bonus points in the first innings is concerned. That would be an interesting to get uh, Peter's point of view on and how that all works last season and and whether the balance is is right for this year. Uh, clearly, um, eight you know eight points is clearly going to incentivize maybe one or two decisions or, or slightly change the way decisions are made um in the second half of in the second half of games. I must admit, watching the championship cricket that I did last summer, I actually never really felt that the the bands really were really really went after. I don't I didn't really get the impression that teams were really going to go after four fifty too often, apart from maybe, you know, the likes of Durham maybe. Um but then again it so, seemed really harsh that you could score Two four nine your first innings and you, and you end up with nothing. Um, so I think that that for me felt like the the area really that potentially could have the more more of an effort to concentrate decisions around could have been made. Um, but they but they've stuck with that. Um, but there's again yet, yet again sort of more tinkering, and then we're going to sort of see hybrid hybrid pitches as well, which I think is going to be really helpful for clearly going to be helpful for ground staff. Um, as far as just the the, you know, the sheer weight of cricket that we that we get, um, so that that's that's really important as well. Um, as you as you as you can as you as you can hear probably from my voice, I'm starting to dr- dr- <laughs> starting to, dr- starting to sound like I'm droning on, but I actually am. But I think these are these are really important nuances that often don't get really any attention before the start of a season, and then we sort of focus on them a little bit when normally when things go wrong. Um, so I think it's important to be. Uh, to be focusing on these and and how they're going to impact on the season, Peter. I don't know whether you, how, how what do you have any sort of broad thoughts about about some of those and and how they might impact on the sort of the dynamics of, of matches this year. Yeah, I mean it'd be interesting. You're right. We often change more than one thing at any given time, so we never got, quite know which thing works and doesn't work, don't we? We sort of swap sometimes rather than one thing. I think two fifty. I couldn't agree more. Two fifty for the first batting point sounds it's too high. Uh, it's 200 for me um, because what you've got to know is a county pitch isn't a test match pitch. There's a difference. Mm. Uh, anybody who comes out of test match cricket, comes back to county cricket, immediately goes, crikey, I forgot that county pitches are hard work. They do a little bit more. That Generally, the, the, the prep isn't as the same as a test match. In fact, sometimes it can be the viewing, everything is not set up. If you're on a test match ground, different, but it's so very conditioned. So it's not as easy to strike the ball. Um, so the idea, I think the idea of the rule changes was, would people get really aggressive to go 450? Well, I think whoever did that and looked at what the county scores are normally, I mean, getting 400 in county cricket often is quite a challenge, full stop. Mm. And it depends what, how you want to reward, but you know, you might get two, four, nine, that might be a winning score. Um, and you don't get your, you don't get any batting points. So I think it depends on grounds. So I think all grounds, some grounds, so if I give you an example on cricket, if you go to India, it accelerates in the back half of the game. So it's flat, 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 and then it breaks up and, and it turns and right square. And there's a lot of English grounds where it accelerates in the first half of the game and then flattens out. And that's weighted against the point system. So it's a really challenging one, how you make the points work in England um, for an exciting game of cricket for people to watch. And I think that that challenge for me with county cricket is, is it there to service the England team? Is it there to provide a spectacle for your members and people to want to watch every day to go, wow, this is great cricket to watch? And that to me is 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 a fundamental question anybody's got to ask before they start whatever rules and how they're going to set it up, really. 
is it is it is it fiddling is it is it trying to find the best formula how do you see the the idea that, it, that we seem to be on an endless carousel of ideas and there's whenever i've spoken to players particularly last year it's not so much the ideas that sound like they're wrong it's more the fact that there's a lack of continuity and like not a commitment to an idea for a period of time where we can actually gauge whether it's going to work or not the one like, thing i'd say it always starts it starts backwards for me what is you what do you want I mean, that people mm. want to watch. And that to me is where it feels that maybe they're going onto that route a little bit. But in some ways, I, it feels now you can nearly split it from international cricket. Players will come out of this to play international cricket. And it's always produced players. You know, we can see the players it's produced recently from the Atkinson, the Brooks. But I don't think it's the format of the game in county level that produces the player. I think the players are good players. And they come up and now they get developed through England, franchise, whatever. That's where they go. I think it's got to produce players. It's a format of the game I certainly love, but it needs protection. So it's got to be able to survive a little bit more in its own its own right, I think, as a game and how that fits into a schedule. So I think no one says it's easy to domestic schedule to get it all to fit together. But I think you've got to look at the county game and say, right, what is it we can produce here that's going to be it's going to be serviceable and work for the next 20 years? Um rather than just a tinker here, tinker there, a heavy roller here, a points change there. I don't mm. think that's really doing it, if I'm honest. Pete, do you think, do you think the Kookaburra does, slash will do what uh, people want of it? I mean, I mean, obviously it's been brought into, I guess, partly to prepare players for, um, for Australia, for playing test cricket abroad. Um, and I guess the upshot is obviously that it forces guys to bowl, you know, to be more creative with their plans, to, as, as Nick said, we, saw, we bowled more spin last year, mainly because of, it might be my understanding of that, I've been speaking to a lot of players the last couple of weeks about this, is that what happened last year was far more about the pitches prepared for those games than than the ball itself. And the idea of the idea of replicating Australian cookbook conditions in April, May, even July of, a, of an English summer is is actually not going to give you anything like what, you know, what you, what you get at... <laughs> At the Gabber in, in in Test One, I mean, is um, do you look at it in terms of a, you know, what what is, um, I, I don't know. Do you, do you look at it in terms of what what it is trying to prepare people for, or, or as a coach, you sort of looking at it and saying, actually, how do we, how do we win this game? How do we find a way of taking twenty ten, taking twenty wickets? What, what is the surface to do that on? And I guess that I guess the hybrid will come to that as well. I mean, what are people expecting from a hybrid on a four day, over four days versus? What would it what would it actually look like in practice? Uh, I think well, one thing I think playing a couple of games with the club is not going to make somebody not going to make us better abroad. I put that mm. out there. You're not going to suddenly get better by playing two or three games with a cooker or a ball. So it'll move less. I yeah. think you might find people leave a bit more grass on the pitches to try and make that negate it to make it more like because we've got English style bowlers. Mm. So again, you've got to ask the question. I, do you want to get rid of the juke? So we're very strong in England with our bowlers, the style of bowlers we've got now. So if you're going to go for a transition and say we want more pace, which everyone's pace and spin, then it's a long-term change that. That's not going to change overnight. It, you know, it's going to be a longer-term change, and that's that's a decision. Will it affect the spectacle of county cricket and people want to watch? Possibly, because people want to watch exciting cricket now. People are impatient. People don't want to watch bland draws. They want to watch a game that moves and moves on. Um, so I think the Kookaburra ball experiment, I think I get it. I get what we're doing with it. I think April and May, if it quietens down and makes it an even balance for that game, great. But each county is going to go about it the same way. They're going to want to see their players get 20 wickets and win the game. That's what they're going to do because that's the competitive edge of the game. If 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 our county game didn't have a competitive edge, it doesn't mean you don't want to produce England players. We desperately do. But if it doesn't got a competitive edge to win on that game in that moment... I don't think it's worth watching. It's middle practice. It has to be a competitive game of cricket where you've got to do everything you can to win that game. And that's going to be the best thing for your players to go through. So it's a really interesting debate. I mean, the Cookerball, we've used it. We had a great game against Surrey last year at the Oval, actually, which they left quite a lot of grass on it. Yeah. Too much, I think, for a juke, but it worked really well for the Cookerball. And it ended up being a draw, but you felt either side could have lost if they'd had a bad session. And neither mm. side did. So that was a really good game of cricket. But I think it was set up to provide a good balance between bat yeah, and ball sure. on the conditions, um, which is what which is what they do in Australia, mm. what they do everywhere, really. You're trying to 
what what the abroad have got sometimes, certainly subcontinent, is they know their pitch will often deteriorate in the back half. And it will turn naturally. English pitches, we use different loans, different stuff. They don't deteriorate a lot. Mm. They get better. So that, to me, there's not a natural unevenness and bounce that comes into a pitch or it, it turns. So spinners don't bowl as much as we'd like and whatever. So one of the best things about the winter was seeing those emerge in those conditions was fantastic to watch. But it's not as easy to change in England. Otherwise, it would have changed before. And as I said to a few people, if you want to produce bland, flat pitches, what we see now with England is we've got hybrid batters. So I watch Pakistan come to places like England and New Zealand. They really struggle against the moving ball. We've got lads who hit it in T20 but can play the moving ball. And I think it's producing batters that can actually broach the world game. In, in some ways, you look at someone like Ben Duckett. He can play it in April when it moves around, but mm -hmm. he can also take it on when it's not. Now, I think we see sometimes subcontinent players move, move around the, the globe and find it quite difficult to play when it's suddenly moving around because they've never experienced. Because you go to Pakistan, I look at their first-class cricket, two-thirds of them are draws. Um, nobody watches it. And that's how it works. So the question is, what do you want? If you want a bland, flat pitch, and you think that's going to encourage people to bowl quick and spin over time, which it might, and that'll make us a better test match team, at the, maybe at the sacrifice of the members not wanting to watch it, then that's quite a big sacrifice for me in a county game that needs to be vibrant and fun to watch. And it's got to attract some new audience at some point. Peter, can I just ask, you mentioned before in a previous answer, the last question on this before we'll move on, uh, you said like tinkering isn't going to do it if we want to make changes that last 10 20 years does that suggest that you're there are kind of certain overhauling changes that you'd like to make or that you think should be made i think i i think it's not an easy fit i mean four comps into our into our season has always been challenging i started in four comps uh, and we couldn't make it fit with the B &H, nat west and a lot of those competitions weren't matching the global game so they were different formats to what the global game was so it didn't really work and we got to three comps and that produced better conditions for people to go and play for England because it was more like the game. So I think you've got a real challenge because counties have got to make money. The game's got to survive. T20's on a revolution and it's growing so fast. So listen, it, do I think it's an easy solution? No. Um, we have to ask some questions and the people who make those calls have got to see it from two sides, I think. One, um, the protection of all formats of the game within how they're going to fit together. And two, enough money in the game to make sure it stays alive and can compete with the other sports. And that's not an easy fit, that's for sure. And you mentioned there kind of the four tournaments or four formats going into one summer. Um, the PCA gave a statement, this is back in like October, November, about the unrelenting domestic schedule, disregarded player welfare. Nick, friend, you come to this <laughs> more than I think anyone else. Uh, can you give the lowdown on kind of what the state of play is as we go into the season and yeah why why is this becoming a, a topic of discussion or becoming a topic of discussion again this season i've been interested in pizza because pizza, pizza, i've spoken to upwards of 50 60 players coaches about this this winter and everyone has <laughs> say sort of broadly similar thoughts but also having while well, also having different opinions within those because there are so many kinds of cricketer now you know i've was really careful to make sure I spoke to white ball players, red ball players, young players, older players, seamers, batters, because really um, <laughs> this has the schedule has a different impact both physically and mentally on um, on everyone. Whether if you are a if you're an all format seamer at one of these smaller counties, let's say where where you've got five, six, seven seamers across your squad, and the you know the impact of resting you know bowler number one. To bring in bowl number five is, is too stark for a county that's trying to compete on all fronts let's say um you, you can be broken i think i mean i think any one any one point last year three percent of the circuit had a stress fracture and if we extrapolate from that figure that stress fractures are primarily fast bowlers injuries so you can remove your your batters your keepers your spinners you know as a general rule from that that's you know doing the rough rough maths you're probably looking at one in seven one in eight fast bowlers have a broken back at any one time, which is, um, <laughs> you know, not a, not, not a physio. It doesn't strike me as wildly, wildly sensible. Um, but on a, um, I think that's your, that's your extreme, but on the, you know, on your, on your day to day, it is, 
a case of, I mean, they, you know, there, there have been little tweaks for this year. And if you're asking what the state of play is, that the state of play, uh, this is sort of the issue, is broadly the same as what it's been, as what it's been. And I think the reason that PCA statement came is because um, the state of play is the same on the back of several meetings and several summits and, and discussions between between players where where the point has been made um and not just made but made in quite um uncertain terms and made with a lot of anecdotal evidence a lot of players you know some counties for example where certainly in the women's regional game where players are still driving back after blast games after um after 50 over games from for away matches which means you're driving down the motorway at three in the morning getting home often of course you're doing that journey then because you're playing that day as well and um i've spoken to players who said they feel well you know they've nearly fallen asleep at the wheel um others who've said that they feel like this will only change when someone does flip on the motorway um when i think the irritation for a lot of players is that actually this is so this has been so proactively sought from, from their end um that the idea of having to be reactive around an issue as serious as player welfare and i think combined with player welfare as well, high performance. I don't think you can have one without the other. If you are if you are knackering players on a daily basis, a lot of whom, of course, are trying to push their best to play for England and in, during the blast to, to put themselves the franchise shop window and all that stuff, you you end up with a product that is neither getting any, any, anyone at their best physically or mentally. So, um, I don't know, I, I'm, I, I could, I mean, I've written about 30,000 words on this, I don't want to, <laughs> I'm conscious of saying too much, well, but, um, but, I mean, but, um, but yeah, I, I don't know. It's, I, I guess the other side is that there is no perfect solution and every single player I've spoken to has said that and no player I've spoken to has presented me with an A4 sheet of paper with what an ideal schedule looks like. Um, and likewise, every player knows that if you start taking away cricket, you know, you, you probably impact that you, they're probably impacting their own salaries and that there is a lot of, there's a lot that goes into this, and, and there is as well as, as Peter said before. There's there is a recognition of the members and what counter cricket exists for, and that there are a load of stakeholders here you're trying to satisfy at once, which is, <laughs> I guess, which is the issue. I mean, I think this schedule, and I know some people disagree because the hundred is in the middle of it. I don't think I've seen a more fan friendly schedule in recent years. You've got all but one championship round straddling the weekend at the request of at, at the request of members and supporters, and you've got a blast schedule that exists basically over the exact same period of time over the over the back end of the week because that's when the the counties require the blast to make the money that basically keeps them you know keep keeps them going keeps them thriving in in some cases so you what we've ended up is a schedule where i think there's county cricket on four tuesdays at all between the start of april and the end of july and two of those tuesdays are one-off blast matches so we've ended up packing talk about four four comps we're packing two of them into half a week which immediately means you are you are just so unrelenting. And then, within those, you've got you take the you take a week from, a, a week off the blast, but that's not a week off. That's a champo week. So, you've got players flipping between formats with, and that might not sound much, but I think the intensity. I mean, get from wrong piece, but I think the, the intensity, the intensity is so much higher in T Twenty cricket than it is in Championship cricket. But the demands of Championship cricket are so much higher than they are in T Twenty cricket because you're doing it for for four days and the challenges are different. There were never more injury complaints last year than at the end of the first championship block. So after players have gone back to back to back to back to back to back for seven weeks. But the only other time when it when that spike competed was in the middle of June when the when the blast sort of hits its peak and you're throwing in those champo rounds around it. So it's really complex. And what I'd say is I don't think it's Alan Ford and full Alan Fordham's fault or the guys who put the schedule together. I think it's a really tough equation. That's been a really tough equation going back to the fifties and sixties and you know, I mean, certainly well predates the hundreds. <clears throat> Can I ask Pete on one one kind of exact issue relating to that? Josh Tong, you have a fast bowler who wants to play for England. Rob Keys kind of said, and I hope I'm not misquoting him too much here. He was like, I don't care about the wickets column. I want you to bowl 87 mile an hour for as much as for as long as possible, basically. Like <laughs> Nick's just laid out the kind of back to back nature of the schedule, the county championship block one. How on earth do you navigate that as a coach? And I, I assume you do care about the wickets column. I'm assuming that's quite an important <laughs> part of uh, what you'd be looking for with when he's walking out of Trent Bridge. Well, you look after your players. I mean, of course you do. I mean, I, I look at everything as pretty much the same way in that um, we're trying to give a, a player the opportunity to go smash the world because the opportunities out there are huge. And at the same time, I think by doing that, they play to so the world's change. It used to be we had 
team together who never went anywhere else. And we'd it organically grow that team. We'd be us and we'd be all together. Now, the way the world is, you really you you coach individuals and teach them how to be part of teams. Now, Josh is an individual, so we have to play him at different times that fits him. It fits England, central contract player. So he's he's got to be able to do what he can. Now, we want him to bowl quick. We signed him as an impact bowler. So the danger is, you know, I always remember Tim Bresden playing at Yorkshire, um, Brezzy, and he was he was ending up doing the donkey work. I remember I became academy director and speaking to him and saying, listen, I've got to find a way for you where you can be more, bowl less, bowl, bowl a bit more impact because he was that he was a really good cricketer who had that in him and he had that ability. Now, I think you're trying to find that with all players. I think we all understand. I think you've been around the game a while. The player will have picked himself in an England team when he was a kid at school. He'll want everything, but he'll want to play well for knots as well. So we're trying to balance that out. Of course, wickets count. And and Keezy's trying to make a point, I think, that you can't go into international cricket and, and do it three-quarter pace. You can sometimes in a county season. And it's so much more tiring. So I often I give the example of international cricket. If if I said to somebody, go and run five hundred meters at three quarter pace, it's a piece of cake. If I said go and run five hundred meters where the loser gets sacked, and you've got to go flat out at the end of those five and one hundred meters, you you feel absolutely you're wasted mentally and physically. Well, Test match cricket is a bit like that. You go in, you're going to have people commentating on you, people judging you. So if your pace drops, it's really noticeable. The people you're playing against will then you won't be as effective as you could be. So there is a level there that's higher than county level that you have to be able to maintain. Now, we've got to understand that with Josh, that he's got to do that if he gets his chance. Uh, but by doing it and practising in that way, he will be impactful for us when we play him. And you need, a, you need a stable of bowlers at county level. We always know that. We're going to move on to... The final part of the show, we're going to do some predictions just to round it off. Peter, you're going to be banned from saying Nottinghamshire are <laughs> winning everything. That's not allowed. I'll take that on so you can't. But before we get there, an important point is that from next week, we will be taking listener questions. So if there are any key issues you want us to discuss or to put to our guests, then please do get in touch on Twitter at The Cricketer Mag or anything longer can be emailed to website at thecricketer.com where it'll get picked up. Nick Howson, I'm coming to you first. Well, you don't have to say who's going to win the league and who's going to get promoted, but I want a kind of general vibe of the kind of biggest winners you're expecting this season, potentially the biggest losers if you're feeling mean, and then we'll go around the circle. Paul, um, biggest winners might be the only winners. I mean, it, you know, it's really boring to say that that Surrey might win the championship, but it does feel like you're sort of betting a little bit again. But it does feel like, yeah, not, not definitely not impossible. Um, the kind of insight we're here for, that's yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, 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 and this, this, this is what this is where I should really just stick to just 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 ripping everyone else. Um, no, I think that it feels like betting against the house a little bit, and it feels a bit like the really obvious thing to say. The problem, the problem with sorry ultimately is is the depth prob- is the depth issue. The amount of times that they were, you know, six or seven down, looking vulnerable. And then someone, you know, uh, you know, Jordan Clark goes and scores, goes and scores runs, or Jamie Oberson goes and scores some runs. Utterly demoralising as a, as an opponent, they will be absolutely there thereabouts, and it doesn't really matter where where the uh, the how their squad is gutted as far as that's concerned. Um, almost goes without saying. I think as far as their authority is concerned, I'm a bit concerned about the chasing pack behind them in terms of. Will they just end up taking each other out a little bit? Um, Hampshire are kind of the team I'm looking at. Um, I know their drought of the title is, I mean, I know that I think only Abba are older. Um, and it's a difficult, a difficult one to make a case for when, you know, the top, the top four, the top, well, how many opening partnerships they had last year? Four. Um, it was one centurion among all of them. Um, so it's difficult to make a case from that perspective. Middle order is clearly absolute class. They've got three seamers with 500 plus first class wickets. I think they're the ones I'm looking at as far as pushing Surrey as far as um, as far as as far as they can. And to be honest, I, I, I think it's going to be quite competitive in the in the midfield as I think I just as I just mentioned. Um, not to be in and amongst that, I, I would expect to. Um, so I think it's going to be. I don't think it's going to be particularly competitive as far as the title is concerned. Maybe only two. I think I can really foresee making an actual break. 
And but I think it will be really competitive underneath that. I don't know if that's really the sexy take you really want from Division One. Um, but I think that's sort of the direction of travel I can see um, as far as as far as that's concerned. Um, and probably a bit more, a bit, a bit of the same in in Div Two as well. But I guess we can we can move on to that as and when. Well, I've I've really enjoyed that. You said there's only two chance, two teams yeah. that might win Div One. Not knots with the head coach on the call. I like that. that, that, that that's proper. Um, uh, Peter, I'm going to come to you next. That's why we're not doing this there. live. <laughs> so does, he, does, he, does he know he's here? I was going to say, I was like, say, say not, Say not quickly. But, right. you're, you're, still, you're still being recorded, yeah? First episode, last episode. Perfect. Uh, Peter, I'm not going to ask you for who you're expecting to kind of win or go down. I would like uh, your insight into kind of, and I'm sorry I'm jumping this on you, kind of the best non-international players to look out for, players that we should be keeping an eye on. Um, and as a second question to that, as fans, what we should be hoping for from Farhan Ahmed this season, he's obviously had such an exciting rise to the England under-19s. People will be familiar with his brother's work, Rayan Ahmed. Um is there a chance he'll get into the first team outright or could the Metro Bank uh, be kind of the place we'll see, be see him? That's question number two. Question number one would be uh, best non-international players that you think that you have an eye on on the circuit. Without the list of names in front of me, it's difficult, actually. There's, I mean, what I do think, there's there's such a bank of, of players now who've had some sort of international exposure, I think, um, that I think... More, most people have had a lot of international exposure. I've only had minimal, if I'm honest. It's who's going to then raise up from that. I think Way, Way England have done it. Um, certainly, white ball cricket, they've got this embarrassment of riches at times. Of you know, they play play a team when England can't play, and they play. It's more the Jacks team um, when Duckett played and stuff like that. And they go to Pakistan and they win easy, and then they it gets altered then for the fifty over. When they got they they got this challenge of who they bring in. I think what I do think on the county circuit, there is, um, there's probably twenty or thirty lads bumping under, and the way that the way that I think Rob set it up is they want a style of play in the different formats, but they're basically saying it used to be you had to do it for two seasons, you had to be you had to show consistency and whatever. I think now it's the style, and if they see enough, Jamie Smith will be one of those. They see something in that, and they think right, we're going to lift you up and give you a chance straight away. And that to me is it's exciting. Um, it means everybody can be in there. I, I do think they shouldn't ignore sometimes players who come a bit later because we've seen that in international cricket. We've seen it with someone like, you know, Sky, Surya Kumar, Yanav coming in later into international cricket and, and blitzing it in some ways. We're seeing in the 2020s place, class and come in again in a way that's phenomenal. So difficult to put a name on but that's what i love about the season because by the end of it we'll be talking about a name we probably haven't really thought about too much because he's emerged uh, on farhan farhan's one of those young lads who's been on the 19th world cup um who looks um he looks a really good player um i think where i sit with farhan at the moment he played he came to our nets the other day we had, we had a day at loughborough um and the most impressive thing was the energy he put into his first ball at sort of like half past nine. We finished at three o'clock with a break, obviously, in between. The same energy at, 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 at three o'clock, the enthusiasm of him to bowl and the quality of it was great. So we have to look after him because as soon as he gets exposed, uh, everybody will view on him. Um, but also we have to create opportunity at the right time. So I think he's he's a really exciting one because he's, 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 a, he's an aggressive spinner who puts great energy on the ball and, and looks like he's got a real chance. And Nick, I'm going to ask you to do some Div 2 for us, kind of who you're expecting to go OK in that regard. And I might ask you for an outlandish prediction at the end. And when I say I might, I will. But um, do Div 2 first. Div 2, we, we, we were talking about the the Skybet Championship before we recorded, weren't we? And sort of mentioned, mentioned, mentioned Rotherham. And at the other end of that, it is interesting when you've got an outlier team, isn't it? And not having Durham in Div 2 this year will naturally just squeeze it all together a bit more and that there was a team that was essentially promoted by August last year. Um, I think it's really tight, like, and that's not me sitting on the fence, although it, although it also is. Um, I, I think you could make a case for any of the eight teams for different reasons. You've got Derbyshire who've invested heavily in their squads, Sussex who came quite close last year, um, Middlesex and North Ends, and Gloucestershire, uh, who have all been, and Yorkshire, who have all been in Div 1 in the last couple of years. Glamorgan, who I might have already said, who, who always 
who have always been thereabouts without being there. Um, and that's seven. To, and Leicester, who had a brilliant end to last season and they've recruited quite nicely. And if they could start as they finished, um, you know, could have a really interesting year. And um, I think individually it's always more interesting. I think, I mean, I think Luce Deploy is a fascinating cricketer who I would guess had the pick of, well, I mean, I would guess with some education that he had the pick of the circuit when he left, when he left Derbyshire and um, becomes eligible for England in the not too distant future. Um, and is already playing as an overseas player back in, <laughs> back in which is essentially his, his home competition, the SA20, which shows how highly he's thought of. Um, and he averaged 80 something in, the, in Div 2 last year. Obviously, he's been a first man pick in the 100 as well. Just a very, very good all format cricketer. I wouldn't, wouldn't surprise me if he ends up captaining Middlesex at some point this season. In some format, he'll certainly make them better in all formats. Um, I think he could have a massive year in terms of what, I mean, as we've said a few times today, I mean, how quickly things can move for players. Um, similarly, um, guys like Ajit Singh Dale at, at Gloucester, who I mean, hasn't, hasn't been talked about much, but can bowl quick and he's got an unusual action. And if you bowl quick with an unusual action in front of the right people and take the right wickets and impress the right players, he, he'll be playing against Harry Brook and Joe Root in week two um, when Gloucester play Yorkshire. I mean, it's not beyond the realm's possibility that someone like that with, say, with, with the skill set, as it were, I mean, could could find themselves sort of bolting pretty pretty quickly, um, but yeah, I mean, so there are a lot of there's so many interesting players and so many. It feels like a really interesting year because there's been there's been so much movement through the winter. Um, I can't remember a year where it's felt like so many players have changed county. I think 57 players have left the game across the men's and women's pro games, which is something like 17 more than last year. Um, and yeah, and a load of players moving counties, a couple going back to former grounds, as former former clubs as well. I mean, um, that's not an outlandish prediction, but um, but I'm in, I'm intrigued. Would be my sort of overall state. <laughs> just, just, to, just, just to build on one or two of those points, I think Nick's it. Um, All the Parkinson twins as well. Yeah, I mean, one team I omitted from the Div One look at was was I, and I think that uh, sorry, Peter, to do this to you again. I think one of the most interesting <laughs> stories this season is is what happens with is what happens at Durham. Um, can you know? I think that that North Campbell Borthwick uh, Trident is one of the strongest. I'm going to keep that on the fence. Uh, one of the strongest sort one of, of groups. One of the strongest eight teams on the on the circuit. So, yeah, one of the strongest eight teams certainly uh, on the circuit. Certainly, and I think eleven counties are starting with a different captain head coach combination to the one they started last season with. Um, and I think that's a really interesting dynamic in terms of how are Durham going to, are they going to be able to implement the same style of cricket, I guess? Are they going to be impinged by England call-ups? You know, I think four batters scored over 800 runs at a strike rate of 60. Can they, can they basically, can they can they do that when the standard is, no disrespect to the teams, in all the teams in Div 2 last year, but a bit higher, they're going to be pushed a bit harder. Um, and there's not going to be the same incentive to go for wins when you've got the the shifting points as well. I think they're really interesting how close they get because I think they could um, do do reasonably well. How close they get, I think, is going to be really interesting. You know, mentioned Derbyshire there as well, Nick. Like, it's, I think Mickey Arthur, you know, third different captain in as many seasons, but he's been looking at this one as the one for mm. some time. I don't think he was massively into the, the the contracts that he inherited. And I think he's now got the probably the, the squad closest to the one that he would ideally like. I think he's got two years left there. How long beyond that, you know, you never know. Derbyshire have got his sort of undivided attention now, given that he's given up the, or given, given that hey, Pakistan gave him up even. Um, so I think that's an interesting an interesting one in there. And I'm also quite interested by North Ants as well. Um, you know, they've, again, another county whose leadership group has been much changed. I think it's seven all format captains in two and a half years. But they have recruited really well. Uh Nair and Shaw are going to be there as well. And when you've got um Ben Sanderson who I think will probably go through four hundred first class wickets this this summer, um there as well. They're going to be there though about so I think Nick's Nick's right it is a bit of a I hate to hate to agree with him um while this is being recorded but it's it does fit div two does feel really really tight uh really tight group um you know nick group of teams and 
frankly, you could make a case for, for most of them going up and, and maybe even a handful of them finishing at the bottom as well. So it should be really interesting. I think as well, the, the, the Lions batch from this winter is interesting because you've got a lot of players. It was, it was a pretty young squad in amongst the likes of Keaton Jennings, Alex Lees, Josh Bannon, who's sort of Lions life is a bit at this at this stage. And got a lot of guys who are coming into sort of their, in a couple of cases, their first full season um, or, um, or on the back of having a real breakthrough year. And it's, yeah, I mean, the likes of James Rue, um, Tom Laws, obviously had next, I mean, has had two excellent years. Casey Aldridge got into that Lions group, Ollie Price, um, uh, James Coles was out there, Callum Parkinson sent his first Lions tour. I think Callum, Park, Callum Parkinson was the, young, was the oldest player on the trip to the UAE, the first part of that winter, and he's only 27, I think. Um, interesting to see how those guys come on. I guess the idea is that sort of pushes a bit more responsibility and, um, I don't know, sort of confidence into you. And that's, I mean, if that if that works, that's, you know, 20 odd players who, who went well last year who are who who better, better this year for that. And that included what about eight, nine spinners, spinners on the original trip as well. So um, if it ever starts raining, they might, they might get, might even get a bowl. Wonderful. So we have anyone winning Div 2. We have Surrey probably winning Div 1. And we have Knott's mid table, which I think is a disgrace. <laughs> I had Knott's for the treble beater, personally. I don't know what these guys are talking about. About, I, didn't say, I, no, I, I didn't say it. <laughs> just like, I was, yeah, just, I was, it was a nick. It was a nick from the cricketer, so it could be uh, kind of ascribed to anyone. Oh, no, no, anyway. bane, bane of both. That bane of both our lives. That <laughs> nobody, nobody. I've got, I've got to read. I've got an ad read to do. Please, nobody covers county cricket like the cricketer, and you can get access to our coverage of all eighteen teams online from as little as three pounds and ninety nine a month. Our own top team of county champions have now won the outstanding online coverage of domestic cricket prize at the ECB Domestic Cricket Journal Journalism Awards for six years running. I bet Peter cannot believe that. Actually, I reckon he can. You'll, you, you, you'll else, never see that. Who else is going to be at Pop and Uh So you don't have to take our word for it. You can take the ECBs as well. Just click the link in the show notes to subscribe. That's been episode one of County Conversation. Thank you to both Nicks. Thank you to Peter Moores. And we will see you and, well, speak to you next week. <laughs>